Claire Pernice and I've been presenting Saturday Stories since 2018. Um, this is a program running monthly at the Society of Illustrators and we invite um, acclaimed, award-winning, absolutely fantastic illustrators of picture books and they come to our programming to share their books, their latest books, or, and they do a program related to that where you do a live hands-on workshop. And since the pandemic, we actually decided more recently to try to do this virtually. And we are very excited because the program has now got a sponsor, a wonderful sponsor, generous um, foundation, the Bruce J. Heim Foundation has given a generous donations that we can offer this program for free. And um, so they really do believe in um, children's picture books, enriching and inspiring kids and as we do as well. Um, the Society of Illustrators has an annual show, the original art show, which is held November and December every year. It's a juried show and the very best picture books are um, represented. We have a lot of submissions. The jury is um, acclaimed editors, um, art directors, illustrators who all look at the work and decide who will be in the show and who the four um, honorees will be. And as I mentioned earlier, for those of you who are just joining us, um, you can uh, view this show until December 23rd online, virtually. You just go onto our website and we'll have that website in the chat so you can see that link if you're not familiar with it. And um, join the show, look at all of the work. There's over 150 um, illustrations represented in all different materials. You can see the title of the book, who the editor, the art director and the publishers are and the medium. So when you look at the label, you'll see what medium the illustrators use to do their artwork. Um, so for today, we have Matthew Cordell, Caldecott Award winner. He won a Caldecott Award in 2018 for his wonderful book, A Wolf in the Snow. And um, he's going to tell us all about his uh, journey into illustration, who were his inspirations, some of them are very similar to mine. I know he loves William Steig, I do too. And um, he's going to be doing a workshop on his latest book, Hello Neighbor, which is the, um, the kind and caring world of Mr. Rogers, which everyone is familiar with. Um, of course, he started in the 1960s, so a lot of um, adults have grown up watching the show, but you can still see the show, it's always on being um, repeated on PBS and also there's a documentary about Mr. Rogers. So this is a beautifully illustrated book. We're going to see exactly how Matthew does his illustrations using pen and ink and watercolors. And for this workshop, if you don't have pen and ink, you can use um, pens like this. I have just micron pens or you can have a, a thin Sharpie or markers, or you can just do it in pencil for your outlines. You can color in using colored pencils, or if you have a little paint set like this, or even like this. Um, Uli is a sponsor of the Saturday Stories program, and they do very nice and expensive watercolor sets. So whatever materials you have at hand, we are going to get started with our workshop. So let's um, introduce Matthew Cordell. Yay! <laughs> Hey, thanks so much. Thanks to everybody for being here today from all over the world um, on a busy, you know, during your busy holiday, holiday season. Um, thank you to the Society of Illustrators for having me. This is really exciting for me. So first I'd like to start out with a, a story time. So we're going to read the, the, my new book, Hello Neighbor. So hopefully everybody can see the, uh, that title slide. It says Matthew Cordell. Is a drawing of uh, America's favorite television neighbor, Mr. Rogers. Right. Okay, so but before we do our story time, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about me. Um, so I live, this is a map, for, I know there's some younger viewers here, but this is a map of our country, the United States. I live where that little red star is. Um, and it's near a big city, a big city that you've probably heard of, Chicago, Illinois, in the US. Um, but I live in a little town near Chicago, it's called Gurney. And it's right at the top of the state of Illinois. But I, you know, I, I was born in a different state. I was born and, and raised in South Carolina. And then I moved to, to Chicago 
when I went to co after college and worked started working in Chicago. So lived a big part of my life in the South, and now I live in uh, the Midwest here, Gurney, Illinois. Um, this is a picture of my family. So some of you watching might be Star Wars fans. I'm a big Star Wars fan. I grew up loving Star Wars, and uh, so I've kind of forced my kids into liking Star Wars. They don't really like it as much as I would like them to like it, <laughs> but uh, but they do enjoy uh, Star Wars. And this was at uh, actually at a comic book convention where if you go to comic book conventions, you can meet different uh, movie stars and television stars and writers and artists of all kind. And um, we got to meet um, the woman in the middle of the picture with those dark glasses on. That is Carrie Fisher, the woman who played Princess Leia. So this is us at a comic book convention. Those are my two children. The little guy dressed as BB-8, the little droid, is is Dean, our son Dean, who is now seven years old. And our daughter there dressed as Ray is is Romy, and she's 12. And that uh, that's me, the tallest person in the picture. And then that's my wife on the other side, Julie. <laughs> and the last person in the picture is a dog and his name is Gary Fisher. So <laughs> Carrie Fisher named her dog Gary Fisher. And uh, some of you may have seen a minute ago, this is our cat Norbert. He was up in my lap a minute ago, but he got, he got, uh, I don't know, he got bored with me. So he took off. So Norbert is our cat. So a little bit about what I do. Um, this is a picture of my studio. So I work in one of the bedrooms of our house and this is actually where I'm sitting right now at too. So um, you're going to get to see that me working today at that desk. And uh, you know, this is where I draw all my pictures for my books and I do a lot of my writing here on my laptop. I do have another computer in the basement of our house. It's a, like a more design computer. It's a Macintosh. And, uh, but I'd, I'd like to work it's that computer, other computers in our basement. So there's not another natural light down there. So I like to work in this, in this upstairs bedroom. And, uh, so I've done a lot of books since uh, my first book came out in 2003 that I illustrated. Um, I've done a lot of books over the years. I've done books that I've illustrated that were written by other authors but I've gotten more and more work where I get to write and illustrate my own books. So a lot of these picture books you see here, some of them are books that I wrote the story and illustrated myself. Um, but I've also done quite a few books where I got get to collaborate with other authors and uh, publishers working on someone else's story. So they're both fun, different challenges. Um, so now I wanna tell you a little bit about me growing up. Uh, in this picture, I was, I think I was four or five years old. And when I was little, you know, for boys and girls that are watching this today, um, you guys have lots of television shows to choose from um, in this day and age. You, you have so many channels, you have so many, you can stream television shows, you can watch them live. But back in my day, you could only watch television as it was came on, as the programs came on the television screen. I know that might be hard to comprehend, but you could only watch television as it was playing on the television set um, live. And so we only had, in the mornings and afternoons, one of the main television uh, stations that we watched for children's television was PBS, which is still uh, a, a big uh, a, a television uh, program you can watch today. But when we watched PBS, as boys and girls, we got to watch Sesame Street. That was one of my favorites. And Sesame Street is still on today, which I still love Sesame Street. Um, another program I watched was The Electric Company. Um, this was on in the 1970s. And you can tell in this, in this picture that they all look like they're living in the 1970s. Similar to Sesame Street, I think. It was sort of a variety style program. And the last program that I watched was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So if you're younger watching this today um, and you're here with us today, you may not have heard of Mr. Rogers and that's totally cool, um, but you've probably heard of uh, Daniel Tiger. So there's a new, there's a, a popular television program for children, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. And Daniel Tiger is a character that was actually created by Mr. Rogers, a man named Mr. Rogers on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. 
But in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, Daniel Tiger was a puppet. And you can see in this picture, Mr. Rogers is there and he's holding a, a puppet. Well, that was Daniel Tiger. That's the original Daniel Tiger. So if you've watched Daniel Tiger, Mr. Rogers was it had a lot of, talked about a lot of similar things that is, is uh, our themes in Daniel Tiger's neighborhood. So you kind of have a, a sense of what that program was like. It was very sweet and sincere. And, but in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, Mr. Rogers would come in to his neighborhood home every day, and every episode was kind of set up in the same way. He would come in in his jacket, like a nice dress jacket and dress shoes, and he would change into a comfortable cardigan sweater and sneakers um, to make his viewers feel comfortable, to make himself feel, feel comfortable. And then he would introduce uh, like a topic or a theme, and usually a neighborhood a uh, friend or visitor would come in to help discuss this topic or theme. And in this picture, we see uh, a, a, a regular character. His name was uh, Mr. McFeely, who was a delivery person. And he was uh, Mr. Rogers' friend. And they would come in and talk about things or sing. And then um, that same theme would be carried through to the next part of the show, which was this sort of make-believe fantasy world. And uh, there would be puppets and different, you know, set, you know, really uh, fantastic set pieces like a castle and an Eiffel Tower and a tree house. And these puppets and people characters in the neighborhood of Make Believe would talk about that same theme. So it would sort of continue through the episode. And then we would go back to sort of the real neighborhood where we'd see Mr. Rogers again, he would talk some more about that theme, and then he would change out of his uh, dress clothes back in, or change out of his comfortable clothes back into his dress clothes and say goodbye to his television neighbor viewer at the end of the episode. So every episode was similar in that way, and also similar in ways where he, Mr. Rogers would talk about sort of real things, you know, real feelings and, you know, emotions and things that not necessarily other television programs would get into, you know, sadness or, um, you know, being, uh, feeling lonely, you know, different things that boys and girls feel. And he really wanted to touch on those. And a lot of the things that, uh, that he would talk about, like accepting others, being kind towards others and, uh, being curious about the world around us and patient thinking about others being selfless, um, it was all done sort of with the love of and respect of boys and girls everywhere. He had this really, this really obvious, really real uh, love for children, which I, you, you could really feel that in every episode that came through with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But I'm not going to read. It would take a while to get through all this, but a, a longer essay about the life of Fred Rogers, some photographs that you can see for, of the actual people that I, that I drew the pictures of, some different behind the scenes photos here. Uh, this is my favorite part at the back of the book. It's called a visual glossary where there's lots of little things in the background of a lot of pictures that I drew that I got to explain in more detail at the back of the book. So you can read this and go back and find these little pictures. Um, there's an essay that I wrote about growing up with Mr. Rogers. I got to thank all the people that helped me make the book. And on the very last page of the book, um, I wanted to end it with another quote from Mr. Rogers that uh, he would say at the end of every episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and he would say, you are a very special person. There's only one person like you in the whole world. There's never been anyone exactly like you before, and there will never be again. And people can like you just because you're you. So that, my friends, is the end of the story time. So now I'm going to turn off the uh, screen share here and so I can oops let's see stop share okay so now I'm gonna try to go with the phone I'm gonna move my phone above my desk All right Matthew while you're getting set up I just wanted to say that a lot of um, people are putting wonderful comments in the chat they are so thrilled that you chose this subject of Mr. Rogers for such a wonderful book. And they've really enjoyed everything you've shown them so far. So many comments, lots of other Star Wars fans as well. Oh, myself. nice. <laughs> so I just want to also tell everybody, please um, do uh, send in okay. your illustrations. Anything that you do today, 
Um, we would love to see what, what you created, and so would Matthew. So if you would like to just send them to my email address, that will be in the chat, um, and I will send those over to Matthew as well. Of course, some of you already may be in touch with Matthew through Instagram and his various social media, so you could also send to him. But we would really love to see what you create today and have fun with yes. the workshop. So uh, I just want to show you some of the things that I use before we get started. So if you don't, so I use um, what I call pen and ink, what, what, not just me, but people call pen and ink, which means that I use these special pens here and they have uh, these little these little points that you can take in and out of the holders. Um, so you can change these. These little points are called nibs. And different nibs sort of draw in different ways. Uh, and in order to get, in order to draw with these pins, you have to dip them. They don't have ink inside the, the, the holder of the pin. You have to dip it into a bottle of ink. So I would, this is my ink that I use. It's a black waterproof India ink. And so most of the pins I use are like that. I also draw a lot with this fountain pen. This is my favorite fountain pen to draw with. It's a, called a Hero 9018. It has a special kind of nib on it that uh, it's, you can see it sort of curls up and you can get a lot of different line textures and line widths out of that type of pen, which is you can do, that's the reason I draw with these nib pens as well. Um, the reason I draw with those instead of a, a pen more commonly used like this today that has ink inside it is that these types of pens, they, when you draw right with them, you get a very consistent straight, sort of not straight, but a consistent thickness of line. And uh, I like my lines to be nice and inconsistent. I like them to be thin and thick and scratchy and choppy. So that's why I use these other types of pens, fountain pens and uh, and, and uh, dip nib pens. And then, um, so I draw all my pictures in pen and ink. And then when I wanna color them, I use mo mostly smaller paint brushes like these to color with uh, watercolor paints, sort of like these, or with, um, you know, different tubes of watercolors. And then I, you know, I have a palette where I make this kind of set up uh, tube watercolors. And uh, so a little combination of two combinations of making art. So it's drawing with a black line, pen and ink, and then coloring is the second step. And I usually color with watercolor. So if you're watching and you want to participate and you don't have pen and ink and you don't have watercolor, you can draw with uh, like Sharpies. If you have a Sharpie, Sharpies are waterproof and you could do watercolor. Or you could, uh, if you wanted, if you don't have a Sharpie, uh, you could draw with, um, with just with a pencil, regular pencil, and then you could add watercolor to pencil, and it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't um, affect the pencil lines. Or you know, whatever you have, if you have a black crayon and you want to color with, uh, with some colored crayons, or if you have uh, colored pencils, black colored pencil, and use colors or uh, whatever you want to do, but we're going to do, be do basically doing two different, two different processes, drawing in line and then coloring as the separate piece. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to draw, I'm just going to show you how I draw. So if you have some paper and you want to draw along, that's fine. I'm going to be moving pretty quickly for this first drawing just to show you um, quickly how I draw. And this is the type of paper that I use when I draw with my fountain pen. This is, I don't know if you can see, it's a, it's a thick watercolor paper um, and it's, it's called cold press, but this particular brand of cold press is, uh, is, is pretty smooth actually. It's a Canson cold press. Canson is the people that make this type of paper this watercolor paper. So I'm going to draw, first thing I'm going to draw is, uh, so I, I've been drawing a lot of myself um, as a mouse. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I draw myself as a mouse. So I'm going to draw myself as a mouse right now. First thing I'm going to draw is a, is a circle. I'm actually going to draw myself as a mouse. Um, 
riding a bike, which I actually never do. <laughs> I, I, I like to ride bikes. I just never, never do for some reason. Um, so I'm going to draw this bicycle wheel. Again, you can draw along. A lot of people, for some reason, don't like to draw bicycles. Um, they say it's one of the hardest things to draw, but I actually, uh, I actually don't mind it. I've drawn a lot of bikes, characters riding bikes over the years. So this is going to be me as a mouse riding a bike. This is my leg, my mouse leg and foot. Uh, and then I'll draw the other leg here. I'm gonna try to move this closer. All right. Okay. Let's see. Let me see if I can get some more light to you. Okay, that's better. All right. Claire, how does that look? Is the lighting okay now? Yeah. Well, it looks okay. great. We can totally see what you're doing. Okay. And it's like you're building this illustration from once, you know, sometimes people start with faces, but you're starting from the bicycle wheel. wheel. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's I think I just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't typically start sort of with the same thing every time, I guess. Um, if I draw a face, you know, I might start with some similar parts of the face, but. Uh, I don't know why. I st Whenever I draw a bike, I always try to start with one of the, the bicycle wheels. And then I usually it's the back wheel. So I'm starting, you're starting to see this bike wheel. So we've got a, we see the bike wheel, we see the mouse uh, legs. So now it's time to draw the rest of this little guy. It's funny, um, we actually found recently we have mice in our house, so <laughs> I love drawing mice, but it might be a little, might have to be a traitor to, to my mice, <laughs> mouse self, and figure out how to deal with these mice that are living in our basement, sadly. Okay, so, so there's one of my ears as a mouse. Little mouse nose, eye, and uh, I'm usually pretty unshaven, so I draw a few little dots on my face there. And then, um, so we've got basically myself here as a mouse, and then I'm going to draw the, uh, the tail, mouse tail. Now you can see as I'm drawing with this fountain pen, if you, uh, it's a special kind of pen that if you, if you hold it at different angles against the paper, you can get thick lines, see how thick that one is. And if I hold it sort of more vertical, you can get more thin lines, sketchy lines. And that's why I love this pen so much. Um, because again, I like lines that have a lot more character. So I'm just going to sketch out maybe some some grass and leaves, trees, in the background. Nothing too detailed or particular. Just some grass to show a little background here, and then uh, I might draw. I like to draw sometimes on a lot of my pictures. I, I, I grew up reading a lot of comics, comic books. So I like to draw sort of a, a panel border. And so again, I'm just going to hold my pen at an angle. So it show, gives you like different uh, thicknesses of line here. Okay. So now we've got a uh, little picture of me riding my bike in ink. Now the, the, the problem, the one problem with this particular fountain pen ink that I use is, is waterproof. Not a lot of fountain pen inks are waterproof, but this one is waterproof, but it takes a while to dry. So I can't add watercolor to this. So I actually drew this same picture 
last night. So it actually looks a lot better because I spent a little more time with it. <laughs> I think it looks better. So um, this picture is nice and dry, this ink. So now I would get out my watercolors. So if you drew that picture and you want to add some watercolor, so you can now get out your watercolor. Uh, if you use watercolor, you might need, of course, some water. You will need water. I have some water here. And so I'm going to just, instead of doing this in full color, what I'm going to do is, uh, let's see, I'm trying to adjust this um, camera thing. Okay, so I'm going to draw to paint it in one color. I like to do that sometimes if I'm sort of in a hurry or if I don't want to spend too much time on a picture. I will just pick one color, and in this case, I'm going to pick blue. I've been whenever I draw myself as a mouse, I'll get my my brush wet here. Matthew, we have a question. Um, how long does the ink take to dry? Uh, what type of ink are you using, please? So this type of ink that I use is called Noodler's Black. Um, and it's pretty easy to find, really. Uh, Noodler's Black. Um, and they make a bunch of different colors, this company, Noodler's. And the ink is, like I said, it is waterproof. So you can see I'm adding some color here, and it's not really running. Um, the ink is not running. Uh, but uh, it takes safely. I usually, if I'm working, if I'm using this pen to make a book, mm -hmm. illustrations for a book, it can take, I usually let it dry overnight, even though it doesn't really take as long as that. But I, I just safely, I don't want to mess up a drawing that I spent a lot of time making. I will, uh, I'll let it dry overnight. But um, it usually, I would say safely at least a few hours before you add water to it, um, just because you don't want to draw this beautiful drawing that you've just drawn and then start to add watercolor and then it just gets all wet and runny, your drawing. So yeah. I'm just adding a little bit of cerulean blue to give this drawing some color. And you can see, you can see that the way that, I'm, that I use watercolor is almost like the way that I draw. It's very loose and quick. I don't, uh, I'm no, I have no interest in coloring right inside the lines, right, you know, hugging right up against the lines. I, I like things loose and, and uh, fresh and uh, very expressive in that way. I don't like things that are, I mean, I, I like to look at things, you know, and that are different. But personally, when I make my art, I don't find as much joy in, uh, in making things that are really tightly made, um, things that are take, things that are, uh, I don't know, I just, I like things that are loose and fast and. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. lively and you, you feel um, this little mouse is moving along in that scene. Um, right. I, I, um, I like that sketchy, you know, there's, um, Jules Pfeiffer, who did roll, I'm yeah. sorry, um, um, Jules Pfeiffer, who did um, Phantom Tollbooth, and yep. also, um, oh, um, I, I'm spacing. Who is the illustrator for Roald Dahl? It's, it's on the tip of my tongue, I totally know. Um, Quentin Blake, yeah. Yeah, Quentin Blake, same sort of um, ink style. Yeah. Lively, lively drawing style. And actually, Yuko was asking that question about um, the ink. Uh, was that the ink that you put in your fountain pen or is that the uh, one you dip into the noodlers? That is the fountain pen ink. So, um, yeah, that, that particular ink is, is specific for fountain pens. Um, I, I, the type of ink, which I'm going to draw with my dip pen here when we get, when we do a, a bit more, um, when I do a little draw along stuff here in a second, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to draw with that pen and that's a different type of ink, which I will talk about. Um, when we get to that exercise. So you can see, I'm just going to kind of, I think I'll just kind of leave it at this, you know, this is a, uh, so I'm, you can see it like, like with the pen that I draw with, how I talked about how I like to have different thicknesses of line. Um, 
what that does is it gives you different sort of densities. So you get really thick, dark black areas when you do that, or you get really soft, sketchy light lines. And I, I kind of approach watercolor in the same way. Sometimes I like to get a lot of paint on my brush, like what I'm doing here, and make it nice and dark blue. But then sometimes I'll add more water and make it light, you know, more like a wash. So it gives you a nice range of darknesses of blue. Even though I'm painting with the same color blue, it gives it a lot of different, uh, different, um, sorry, it's, it's interesting to draw and paint while you talk. It's, it's <laughs> kind of a skill. No, you're doing a brilliant and, job, doing a brilliant job. So yes, I, I see it gives it more depth than um, I think. Exactly, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So, I had a go at that sketch and it was really fun to do it so loosely. I love it. Yeah, so I think we'll leave that there. Now um, I'm going to get out uh, some, some slightly different. So this is a different paper too. So this paper is, is called Canson. Um, one second, I'll look at that. It's, uh, it's actually not a, not a very expensive watercolor paper. It's called Canson XL. And you can buy it in a pad, actually, and it's uh, it's cold press. They call it a cold press, but cold press usually means it has a bit of a texture on the surface. And this tech, this paper has a slight texture, but it's uh, it's smooth enough to where you can draw. With not all fountain pens will will take very well to a cold press paper, um, just because of the nature of the nib that you're drawing with with a fountain pen. But this is smooth enough to where you can draw with the fountain pen, but it's also nice, has a nice texture to it as well, um, so that it does break up your line and your watercolor gives it a nice texture when you finish the, the drawing. So there we have a, a fountain pen, pen and ink and watercolor drawing. So now I'm gonna use a different type of paper. And this, sorry, what did you say? I'm just reading a few questions as we go along. Um, so Liz would like to know, are you using your colors straight from the tube or, or the little, you know, cake palette, um, or are you mixing them? She's wondering because how do you keep the consistency throughout your picture book? Um, and what kind well, of brush are yeah, so <laughs> When I'm working on, like in that picture I, that I did just there, I did, uh, I did, um, use just one color and it was straight out of the tube even though it's from this palette here this mm -hmm. is these all these little blobs are just squirted directly out of the tubes and i actually wrote the the names down because these were some new paints i was using just to kind of remind myself what was what um but when i'm painting in my books i do end up mixing um colors mm -hmm. uh as i'm painting um so yeah, it's a, sometimes I'll use, you know, straight from the tube, but a, a lot of times when I'm, when I'm painting a picture that's a lot of different colors, mm -hmm. I will either mix in a palette or I'll mix it directly on the paper. So, all right, so now I'm going to draw, this paper here is, is a different paper. It's called Arches uh, Cold Press, Cold Press again. And it's hard to tell from, a, you know, in this zoom, but this paper has a little bit more of a toothy textured surface to it so now i'm going to use this ink it's a uh, it's india ink it's a it's a black waterproof i usually use speedball um i'm not really loyal to any particular brand of ink but i just like the shape of this bottle <laughs> so i've always used this for many years um it just has a nice open uh you know, it's nice to get your pen, easy to get your pen that you dip in and out of this bottle. You can see it's a nice big opening here. Yeah. So um, now I'm going to draw with one of my dip pens on the on the paper that I use. And so what I what you have to do is like, again, there's no you can't draw anything with it when you first take out a clean pen. So you have to dip it into your ink here. So I'm going to dip it and you just dip it just enough to get this the tip get enough on the tip. I don't like to dip it all the way down to the ink come up here. It's just too much ink for me on the nib. So I get just enough 
to get a little bit drawn. So the first thing I'm going to draw, and hopefully we, at this point, let's all try to draw along. I'm going to draw slowly enough, hopefully, that you all can uh, can draw along. So the first thing I'm going to draw is I'm going to draw a picture of Daniel Tiger. So when I draw Daniel Tiger, first I like to start with um, Daniel's ear. So I'm going to draw a little curved shape like that. And then I'll draw the top of Daniel's head and another ear here. So we got the top of Daniel's head and his ears. And then uh, you can draw another couple lines inside the ears to give it a little more depth. And Daniel, of course, being a tiger, he needs some stripes. So we're gonna draw three stripes. You can see the line is breaking up, starting to break up, meaning I need some more ink on my nib. So I'll dip it again. And then I'm gonna draw Daniel's eyes. So let's draw Daniel's eyes, two circles. And again, you can see my lines are really inconsistent, you know, different thicknesses, a couple lines in each eye. And that's how I like it. I just love, that's how I like to express myself through my drawings is with a different sketchiness, scribbliness, you know, different different thicknesses of line. So underneath the eyes, let's draw his nose, which is a simple shape, a triangle upside down. And his mouth is just two curves like that. Okay. And then we'll draw Daniel's, uh, we'll start to draw around his head on both sides of his head. So draw couple curved lines like this. And this is the Daniel, I should say, this is the Daniel Tiger from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, not from Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Um, I like to draw the sort of old school classic Daniel. And then we'll draw some more stripes on the sides of his head here. The way that I get the different thicknesses of line with this pen is the harder you push down on this nib, the thicker your line is. So I'm going to get a little more ink show you. Um, if you push it down firmly against the paper, you get a nice thick line. If you hold it sort of gently on the paper, the line is nice and thin. This, so the, the less pressure you put on it, or the more pressure, it varies, really wildly varies the type of line you can get. So, so let's get back to Daniel. We're going to draw Daniel's, uh, let's draw a couple whiskers on each side. One whisker. So two whiskers, and then we'll draw Daniel's, um, I'll start to draw his arm, one of his arms here, another one here. And you can see I, I like to sketch a little bit when I draw, not just draw like really tight, uh, really tight, tightly solid lines. And uh, so you can draw, some more stripes, Daniel's arms, and then he wears a watch, actually. Daniel has a little wristwatch on, so we'll draw a little wristwatch here on his left arm. Some more stripes on his body. So this is Daniel the puppet. So now, um, before we finish, we're gonna draw. We're gonna draw everything in line first, and give it a little bit of time to draw, and then we'll circle back and draw, uh, put a little watercolor on each piece. So we're going to draw a little, like I did with myself as a, as a mouse, we're going to draw a little sort of frame around Daniel here. So draw a little oval circle shape, or you can even draw a square. I have a few questions, um, Matthew. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of people who are interested in knowing what kind of nib you're using. Yeah, so this is, um, this is a nib that a friend of mine sh told me about, uh, another illustrator friend named Frank Dormer, who does children's books. And he said, uh, I got a cool nib for you to use. It's a, it's a Waverly nib. And um, these are like old British nibs. And I think, um, I'm not even sure if they make these anymore, but he, uh, he gave me a massive 10 of these things. So I have about 100 
of these Waverly nibs. I'm, uh, that's what I'm drawn with right now here. Um, I'm just gonna draw a little, so this is kind of like a, a nice little picture frame. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna draw. So uh, yeah, I use a Waverly nib. I, I have another pin here and this is, a, this is another nib that I use a lot. You can see this nib is not quite as sharp on the tip as this one which you can get different textures of line and stuff with, with the different type of nib. And this is called a J nib. I don't know if you can see that, but it's got a big J on it. <laughs> and I, I believe that nib is also a British nib. Um, but some of these nibs are, are, can be hard to find. You end up, I've ended up looking on finding different websites that, uh, that sell like, people that hoard nibs you know from over the years and they have you know big quantities kept up in their collection that they sell and I actually ordered both of these nibs some of uh, this one I got from Frank but I ordered a few more and I ordered the nibs from a, a, a little place in, in England uh, I'm trying to remember the name but uh, it was a little website that sells just weird you know niche niche oh, business something yeah. like Harry Potter store yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um, so a couple more um technical questions um i had somebody asking what weight is your arches paper and also okay. someone else wanted to know do you use the um oh, what was the the other paper the canson extra xl for your books yeah. okay those are the two paper questions yeah so i use I always use 140 pound uh watercolor paper um, anything lighter just is just too flimsy and just buckles too much and I just don't like the 90 pound um, and anything heavier you can get heavier like 300 pound I believe you can buy but it's really expensive and uh, I guess I'm kind of cheap like that so I, I like to stick with the sort of middle middle of the road um, 140 pound uh, watercolor paper in both cases but i have used both papers for books i just finished a book where i used uh i used um the the fountain pen to draw with and uh, that was the first book i'd actually done with my fountain pen on the canson paper oh, all right so do you so use um, pencil to sketch ever first or oh um, yeah yeah so that's a good question so normally i do um i do use pencil uh because pen drawing with pen straight away can be really intimidating because there's really no turning back once you get started so i do a lot of times draw with uh with pen i'm uh, sorry with pencil first and then and then take it to the pen but you know i like to challenge myself these days and draw dr directly with pen um, i just think it can give you some unexpected results and I think and, uh, your point is very fresh. You know, sometimes in your sketching process, that might be a really good sketch. You know what I mean? Because it's yeah, exactly. When you do. Yeah. Um, right, right. So I just a couple more questions. Are you planning on doing any more books with Philip Steed? Um, this is oh, from yeah. Rebecca Thompson. Yeah, good question. Um, before I answer that, I'm just gonna I'm gonna draw another drawing here. So if you'd like to draw along, I'm gonna draw another character named X the Owl. Oh, so yeah. I'm just going to draw X while I talk. Um, I am going to draw, I am going to do a, more books with my Phil Stead. He's a good friend of mine. He writes and illustrates books for children as well. Um, and we have done several books together. Well, we've done, we've done two together so far. Uh, the first one was called Special Delivery. And, uh, and the second one was a sequel to that called The Only Fish in the Sea. And we have a third book based with a lot of those same characters. And it's coming out um, this year or in 2021, this coming year. And uh, it's called Follow That Frog. So mm -hmm. that is the next book we're doing together. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we have another book that we're getting ready to start together as well. So um, we, get, we like to work together and we're friends. So it's really kind of a fun, a fun thing whenever we get to make books together. Me and my pal, Phil Stead. Wonderful, great. So I'm just drawing X, he's an owl. 
So I'm just drawing his feathers here. Okay, big fluffy feathers. And then I'm gonna draw uh, another picture frame around X. All right. Okay, just like we did with Daniel, got these dueling uh, picture frames. Somebody wants to know, are you going to ever make a Star Wars book? Or oh, you... good question. Somebody wants to know, Denzel Wilson. <laughs> yeah, good question, my friend. So I love Star Wars, and I, it's actually kind of a dream of mine to be able to make a Star Wars book of some sort. Um, and I've got a couple ideas of how I can interpret my style and what I could do with a picture book. And it's interesting that you ask that because I'm currently, I don't want to say too much and jinx myself, but I am currently in talks with a publisher about the possibility of making that happen. So yeah, um, <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah we've, we're, we're still in the talks. We haven't made anything official, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm really excited. Every time we talk more about, what we're thinking about doing it gets more and more exciting and it feels like it might happen but um, a lot of times you just can't tell until you get that signed contract <laughs> mm -hmm. if uh if it's going to be an actual thing or not so i don't like to jinx myself too much but yeah i love star wars so hopefully one day i'll be able to do a star wars book and that draw would, some of my favorite characters that would be excellent um, do you happen to know what the original uh, name for X is? What was the origin of the name, Vincent's asking? Oh, that's a really good question, and I, I have no idea, actually. Um, okay, if anyone knows that, please uh, put that in the chat. I don't know if that was like a, if that was just a question, or if actually someone knows that. I would love to know if there's yes, an answer. Yes, knows. Let us know. Um, also, here's a very good question from Tasha. She wants to know, is there anything that you wish you had um, known about using watercolor that you learned the hard way? Oh, hmm. Good question. So I, even though I've, I grew up taking art classes and, you know, I, was, I, I went to school for art, college and everything, that I never took a class in pen and ink or watercolor. <laughs> so uh, both of these things, I both of the ways that I make my art now are totally pretty self-taught, you know. Um, so there were things I wish I knew about both processes. Um, in terms of watercolor, uh, it's really just technical things like, uh, you know, I didn't realize in the beginning that if you, if you, you, you should, you know, tape your paper down or stretch it out Mm -hmm. um before you work otherwise the paper just gets really wavy <laughs> mm -hmm. so I was doing a lot of work that was like just really buckled and wavy and you know it's fine like you can still work with that with when, when the publishers scan the books and stuff but uh it's just nice to have it sort of as flat as can be um but I didn't do that for many years so that was sort of a technical thing I, I wish I'd realized earlier on um, so speaking of watercolor, we're going to start and do a little watercolor on Daniel. I'm going to get uh, my brush, one of my brushes wet here with a little bit of paint. I'm going to pick like sort of an orange, yellowish, brownish. You can see I'm going to, I'm actually going to just go right into these different pans and, uh, and just start to paint in Daniel here. Oh, I'm sorry. So sometimes um, children are using their parents' computers. So that question um, that was about, are you going to make a Star Wars book was by Alana. And she's a little oh, girl. She's not Denzel. That must be her dad. <laughs> or she's using somebody's computer. Um, oh, uh, one of my students is asking, hi, Valentina, what is your favorite color? Oh, good question. Um, I... It's changed over the years for me, actually. Um, for many years, I liked the color blue, like the different shades of blue, like a, 
like a cerulean blue, which can be like um, sort of a almost kind of sky blue color. Um, but I've also liked kind of a um, like an aqua, like a teal type blue. I really like. Um, but now I think one of my favorite colors is actually red. I use red a lot in a lot of my books. Um, not not in huge big stretches of red, but I like to use it as like a like a little pop of color here and there. And um, for my book Wolf in the Snow, I made the girl's coat red because it really s sort of pops off the page on what I, normally where there was just soft blues and you know the blacks and blues around the book to have this big bright red of the girl's jacket. It really stood out on the on the page so um and then with hello neighbor i used red uh as, as in sort of a similar way uh with mr rogers sweater which he actually did he's sort of more known for that red he wore all different colors of sweaters but for some reason he's sort of really known i think to, uh, with his red sweater so i ended up drawing him a lot in his red sweater in hello neighbor so red has become a favorite color of mine as a just as a way of um like i say calling out a a, a, a a picture a part of a picture or a character um it gives it a, a nice way to to draw your eye yes. really quickly to that thing so okay. red has become my favorite color nowadays great um i've got a few more questions um so we do have an answer from madeline who says she thinks it's because in Children's Corner, Al es escaped from a cage. <laughs> oh. Very good answer. Ooh, I love that. Um, I hope that is true. I, I would love for that. <laughs> I want everyone to know that um, we will be showing this video on our YouTube tech channel, but also Matthew is on our SI Kids page on the Society of Illustrators website. And he is showing you how to do some drawing there in a video and you can meet him there. We have a meet the illustrator page and there'll be a link to Matthew's website where you can find out more about him and all his books. Um, so do explore our website. Do look at the original art show. And um, oh, what is your favorite book that you made? Oh, um, so question, isn't it? I'm sure there are lots of Yeah, them. yeah. So that actually changes from for me as well uh, over over time uh, a lot of times my favorite book that i've made is uh is my newest book because i feel like with every book that i make i learn something more about art and making pictures and writing and um so i feel like i get a little bit better at the, the way that i want to express myself with every book that i make so oftentimes i feel like um, then my latest book is my best work. And so I'd say my favorite book currently would would be Hello Neighbor, I think. And uh, it's sort of a close tie because Wolf, my book Wolf in the Snow has such special meaning for me um, after having won the award that uh, it will always have a very special place in my heart, uh, Wolf in the Snow. So uh, it's always going to be one of my favorites, just because not only because of the book itself, but just because of the journey that it took me on in my life. Um, so yeah, Wolf in the Snow and Hello Neighbor are kind of uh, my favorite two books, I think I could say safely. Good question. So you can see I'm just painting quickly and roughly single colors um, on these pictures. And uh, what I'm actually going to do, if you if you do that, it's almost sort of like a it's a very f almost flat way of of coloring something to just paint it one color. Um, so what I do is I let that dry, or I might want to um, mix a, a second color in this color while it's wet. Um, but what I'm going to do. I think in the case of both of these little drawings is uh, once once that first color is dry, I like to go in and add a second or third color, either as a shadow or a highlight. 
And it, what it does is it gives you a, some more dimension to that shape that you just that you just uh, that you just created. So around the picture frames, I'm gonna they're sort of golden right now, but I'm gonna add a little bit of orange, which gives it a kind of a almost makes it sort of a shine a little bit. Looks more golden when you add that second dark color. Almost looks like an actual golden picture frame. So I'm going to do that same thing. I'm using orange now, the first color with yellow. Nice. Just add a little, little bits around the edges here. Wonderful tips. Um, Matthew, also people are, um, we're probably going to do a list actually, because we have a lot of um, materials questions. Um, yeah. but we're being asked, what is the tube paint and what is the cake palette. I, I did mention Uli, which do a similar mm -hmm. palette, but what's the one you're using there, people are asking? This is one that I've used since sort of the beginning that I started using watercolor, and it's, uh, it's a brand called Angora, and I don't really know anything about it. Um, it's sort of a middle grade um, pan watercolor they're kind of chalky. Um, they're not super dense, but I kind of gotten used to that. So you kind of really have to use a lot of it. But I like most of my painting is done using sort of thin washes. So it works well for me. But um, so I use that and then I don't have any tubes laying here, but I've, uh, I think all or most of these tubes are uh, that I've used in this pan here are, are, are a brand called Van Gogh, which is also sort of a middle grade. Yeah. Um, this one, this one is a uh, Windsor Newton. I use a lot of different different brands. Um, use some of the Blick brand watercolors. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not really loyal to any particular brand, I guess. Um, I am. I do love my um, Windsor Newton sable brushes. For a long time, I used sort of cheap brushes. And these things are, they're really, they're much more expensive, but they're so worth it. Um, they're just sort of like the difference of, uh, I don't know, uh, using like a sharp knife and a dull knife, you know, it's a, it's a, it just makes a world of difference when you have a really good brush. Excellent tip. I, I really do agree. I think, you know, for any budding illustrators or if we have other illustrators in our, um, you know, you know, panel, uh, you know, not panelists, sorry, participants. I'm sure we've got a, a mix of um, audience, but uh, going to an art store or looking at art supplies is like going to a candy store, switch, right. and um, you just like experiment with different materials from the cheaper to the more expensive, and you'll get a feel for what you like to use. And I do think um, you're right that finding favorite brushes, you know, you want to spend a little bit more money on brushes because you don't want all the hairs to keep falling out and um, right. Yeah. Is that does tend to happen. So we're already getting. I'm very excited to tell everybody some um, illustrations have come in on my um, email. Oh, nice. Live, live, I have a fantastic drawing of um, uh, what's his name, Daniel Tiger, Daniel Tiger, and also of a mouse and a boy riding a bike, a man riding a bike. Very nice. From Dana and Toma. Thanks, Dana and Toma. Um, so yeah, do send in your illustrations. I'll share those with you um, as well, Matthew, shortly. Yeah, yeah. So you can see right now, I am adding that second color. And it's usually I like to not, so this is Daniel's kind of reddish or, or orangish, yellowish, you know, that's his sort of color. Um, when I add a shadow, I don't like to just add a darker version of that. I like to add a whole different color. So I've actually used purple like a light purple here and you know what that's sort of like uh, sort of a basic color theory uh that sort of basic color theory is that um you don't uh the shadows of your subject are not are not you know everything is not one color um so for instance if you look if you're just looking at your hand in real life and you look at the shadows you know your hand might look pink or brown or whatever color your skin is and uh, the shadows are, are are made up of all different colors, you know, even your hand itself. And and if so, if you add shadows that are different colors, that sort of accent the original color, it makes it look more real. It gives it more depth and gives it more life. 
So uh, a lot of times the colors that I choose for my shadows or highlights would be a different color uh, from the one that I that I originally painted with. And sometimes I pick a color that doesn't work well. So I'll paint, start painting it and I'm like, oh gosh, that's a terrible color. So I'll take a piece of uh, uh, paper towel and just dab it on that paint. And, it, and that's sort of your only way to erase watercolor <laughs> is if you have like a cloth or a, a dry paper towel and you just smash it on that paint, it will pick it up. You'll still see a little bit of it but it should pick up enough to where it's almost like you've erased it. And uh, so I keep a piece of paper towel, you know, handy at all times and just rip pieces off as needed. Um, and because uh, yes, mistakes do are made and watercolor is like one of the most unforgiving mediums that you can work in, but there are little cheats you can do like that where you can, uh, you can sort of uh, save yourself. <laughs> yeah. So you keep a little yeah. there. Yeah. So I got that Daniel. Uh, so and I did the same thing with the background. You know, in, in in this case, I did use like a darker blue because I wanted the background to kind of be have a little less life than the subject itself. So I made a darker blue just to give it a little shadow in the background there for Daniel. Yeah, it looks wonderful. Love it. Um, Start to paint X. So, X. Um, do you scan your art and um, do anything with Photoshop? Is a question. Uh, yeah. So I am pretty much completely traditional. I I've used sort of I use technology in different ways. I um, I use it. I I don't. You know, whenever my art, my all my art is original art. It's not, uh, it's not digital. But sometimes when I make all my drawings, uh, just the line work, uh, mm -hmm. I will scan them. So I do have a computer and a scanner in a different mm -hmm. part of my house, my studio, different studio downstairs, and uh, I will scan the drawings. And then so it, once I start to paint the colors, sometimes I'll mess it up. You know, and I and then it, if, if it's a really detailed drawing that took me like half a day or a day to to draw all that, mm -hmm. it will uh it would be a real pain to have to draw that whole thing again. So I I'll just print out that drawing. I have a big a big printer when I can print on watercolor paper with this special printer, and uh and sometimes I can I used to do whole books that way, um, but I really just love the the kind of spontaneity of a fresh ink drawing and sort of embracing the mistakes the inaccuracies and so i i don't do so much of that anymore but i if i have a mistake and uh with the watercolor sometimes i will print out that drawing um but for the most part i do not use the computer for my final art uh i just uh i just love the uh the freshness the the Again, the spontaneity of a of an original drawing, um, yes. and not not just not overworking it, you know. And I feel like on the computer sometimes I would just keep working on it and working on it and undoing things, and it just it kind of kills it after a while, I think. And so I've uh, really just grown to love just keeping it as it is, and uh, nice. not not being too too uh, controlling. Mm -hmm. So yeah. What about favorite books, um, maybe a favorite book as a child, and maybe favorite book throughout your life <laughs> that stuck oh, with you. <laughs> yeah, um, my favorite books as a child. So I grew up in the '70s, and um, so I don't trying to think of what was around at that time. I know that my mom read to me a lot when I was young, and uh, I remember being read um, things like. Uh, Dr. Seuss, you know, a lot of the sort of classics. And so I really loved Dr. Seuss and Richard Scarry. I really loved just those like really wacky uh, little towns and so much detail and characters and animal characters. I, I loved Richard Scarry growing up. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, 
I still read quite a, a bit of picture books and I, I just love, I love, um, I love picture book art and, and writing that is, that is, uh, just loose, you know, it's, it's sort of experimental at times and, and it, uh, it, uh, it's kind of, you know, I hesitate to say this, but it's kind of ugly, you know, <laughs> it's not, when you first look at it, it, it sort of takes you by surprise at least, you know, you, uh, you're surprised by how different it looks, you know? And um, so I like art and artists that approach their work in that way. Um, mm -hmm. As far as some contemporary illustrators whose work I love, uh, I love um, an artist, I love her work, her name's Katya Chin. Oh, yes, I, I'll just do a shout out to Katya Chin because she actually won the gold medal for the yes. original art show this year, so. That's yeah. right, yeah. Very, yep. for uh, the bear and the moon i believe yes. that book is called yes. That's and right. it's very very much deserved um so i love her work and uh, uh i love people that sort of flit around from book to book too like um i have, I have an illustrator friend david ezra stein who works a lot like that he kind of changes his style and uses different art supplies for a lot of his different books that he's made um in terms of more classics, I love, um, as you mentioned, William Steig. Yes, I'm a huge William Steig fan. And uh, as you also mentioned, Quentin Blake. You know, a lot of my, a lot of my influences, I think, are pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, Quentin Blake and Jules Pfeiffer. Uh, I also love a British illustrator. His, his name is um, John Birmingham, mm -hmm. whose his work is just really out there, I feel like. His books are really really i don't know they're really unusual and funny at times but he also has a way of making things really sweet and uh has sort of a, an emotional impact at times and so um yeah i think i just I, i'm really drawn to the work of people that uh, that uh that do things sort of differently or yes um, yes not very clean clean you know clean meaning like really polished art and I think that's a part of why I don't work digitally too is sometimes it's even no matter how much you try to make it look sort of rough and raw it still has a sort of a cleanliness to it that doesn't satisfy me in a way that just traditional artwork does so um well I think for our viewers you know it's rather refreshing to see that you know doing um illustration without too much um technical you know finesse can be really satisfying so enjoyable and the illustrations come out looking um so appealing and inspiring i, I just love your illustration style too matthew it's it's fabulous and a lot of your favorite illustrators are in my lineup of favorite illustrators as well um, so we actually are coming sadly to um, the last four minutes of our uh, Saturday Stories program. And okay. I hope you all had an incredibly good time. There are some more questions that were in our um, lineup of chat here, but I didn't quite get to absolutely everyone. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't, but we can always um, send in any questions you have and I know Matthew would be very happy to answer some. So if you had a few questions, you can email those with your drawings to me. And I'll, or if you go to uh, Matthew's website or Instagram, um, you can chat with him there on Instagram. And um, yeah. we really look forward to seeing everything that you've done if you're willing to send in some of your artwork. I hope you had an incredibly good time. I hope you get some art supplies for holiday gifts, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> You are budding illustrators. That's always exciting, isn't it? To experiment with new uh, materials. So thank you so, so much, Matthew. This has been such a fantastic Saturday Stories morning. I'm sure everyone's going to continue drawing away. They just got inspired. And um, I want to wish everybody uh, happy holidays. Stay well. Um, yeah. Join us again yeah. for Saturday yeah. Stories programming. And check out Hello, Mr. Rogers. It's a fantastic book to have. And look at other books that obviously are wonderful books that Matthew's done as well. So 
Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for being here. This was a lot of fun. This is actually the first time I've used my phone to uh, <laughs> to show people what I'm drawing. It was it was a fun. fun it worked uh, well. Yes, it's very successful. So yeah. <laughs> we hope to have you again in the future. More books. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Take care, everybody.